violence and to homicide. Um, looking at rurality and urbanicity, as of March 2020, a mere 1% of the nation's intensive care unit beds and 2% of the nation's acute care hospital beds were located in a rural area. And this is despite rural Americans having higher rates of chronic disease, including coronary heart disease and diabetes. Um, looking at healthcare quality, in 2021, the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality identified that people of lower socioeconomic status experience worse care than members of high income households for more than half of quality measures assessed. And so these quality measures cover domains of patient safety, care coordination and affordability, treatment effectiveness, and access. Specific disparities included lack of access to health care insurance or adequate health care insurance and health care services. And then lastly, looking at sexual identity, sexual minorities have increased rates of mental illness, substance misuse, and suicide. In 2017, teenagers identifying as a member of a sexual minority group were 3.8 times more likely to report a suicide attempt than their heterosexual peers. Next slide, please. So next we'll turn our attention to health in insurance coverage status and type. And so this is a figure from the US Census Bureau. In 2020, Hispanics had the highest uninsured rate at 18.3% followed by Blacks at 10.4%, Asians at 5.9%, and then lastly, non-Hispanic Whites at 5.4%. Disparities by nativity were also observed in insurance coverage, with native-born persons having the highest rate of insurance coverage, and in contrast, persons without citizenship had the lowest insurance coverage at a 30.6 uninsured rate. Looking at insurance type, lower percentages of Hispanics and Blacks had private health insurance when compared to non-Hispanic whites. Next slide, please. So these next figures focus on Nebraska specifically, looking at both perceived health, health status and healthcare coverage. So beginning with the figure on the left-hand side of this slide, Hispanics had the highest percentage of individuals perceiving their health status as fair or poor. And this percentage was approximately 2.5 times greater than that of whites. At 10.3%, Asians saw the lowest percentage of any population perceiving their health status as fair or poor. And then looking at healthcare coverage on the right-hand side of this slide, the proportion of Hispanics with no healthcare coverage was almost four times that of whites at 46.4% versus 12.6%. Um, next slide, please. So now I'll turn it back over to Abby to discuss health inequity and disasters and emerging infectious diseases. Thanks, Sarah. And I think, you know, as we look at the data, I think it just gives us important kind of capture points of, of the experience of, um, of different inequities throughout our system, kind of a pointing again back up to that image of those um, people standing up against the fence, um, important to take into consideration just the landscape as we start to talk about inequity and disasters and emerging infectious diseases. So I think over the course of COVID-19, um, you know, we saw what we had seen before, which is that minoritized and socially disenfranchised populations suffered disproportionate morbidity and mortality. Um, as they had during every U.S. public health emergency. So we, we saw, um, you know, greater exposure and greater illness. Um, and, and this, I think, has an, a really important line that goes through to work. And so I know there's a lot of ways to look at health equity, but, you know, the way that we're choosing to kind of frame some of the examples out on it today are through a, this idea of essential work. So in, in addition to barriers to accessing resource needed to be healthy, many individuals um, were then asked to take on increased risk to disease exposure through their roles at essential, as essential workers. And I think if you can remember back to um, 
you know, early 2020, there was an executive order um, by President Trump at that time, April 28th, kind of declaring some workers essential. And what that meant is that while some of us got to stay home or had greater protections around us from this emerging infectious disease, other people had to continue to go to work, had to continue to make sure that the economy ran. Um, and that we had food on the table, that there were um, long-term care continued to work. Um, there were these key workers that were deemed essential um, during COVID-19. And we can go to the next slide, please. And I think the important point of that was there, you know, in addition to what Sarah just scoped out, where there are these inequities that run throughout U.S. healthcare and public health um, resources um, to different groups for different reasons. Um, then there became an intersection where there was a compounding um, due to an increased increased risk of exposure. So you have low wage workers um, who are disproportionately mar marginalized by virtue of um, intersecting identities, including country of origin, limited English proficiency, immigration, refugee status, socioeconomic status, and also rural locale um, that are then also asked to um, take on increased risk of exposure um, to an emerging disease. We can go to next slide, please. Um, and that makes the idea of health equity really intertwined with work, especially this idea of frontline or essential work. Um, and, you know, we saw certain um, essential workers, long-term care workers, home health aides, food, food supply workers, um, really being the hardest hit in terms of um, exposure and disease burden during those that first year of the of the pandemic. And I think, you know, as we think about preparedness and response, um, those of us in preparedness response thinks about this, you know, workers who wouldn't have prepared for the risk of a disease exposure um, in the way that healthcare workers might have prepared for disease exposure were then asked to continue to go to work without the same protections um, and in some cases without adequate protections. And this is a really key um, piece of, of thinking about health equity, especially in an emerging infectious disease, is that you know things that are really central to protection, um, infection prevention and control guidance, for instance. Um, it, 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 over that first year, the pandemic emphasized the importance of adequate protections for some workers, but often neglected personnel and other key frontline roles where we might not have had an evidence base for infection prevention and control for a place like a meat processing plant, for instance. Um, and so those, um, th those guidance had to be kind of quickly adapted um, and protections and supplies and resources had to be brought to bear for other frontline roles. Um, and so I'll go ahead and, and hand it over to Sarah to talk a little bit more about that. Yes, uh, next slide, please. So as Abby previously mentioned, uh, we conducted a literature review on the interconnectedness of health inequities and disaster preparedness response. And these are just a few headlines of the articles we identified. And so as you can see, the exacerbation of health inequities can be observed across disaster types. So we can see the H1N1 pandemic, um, Hurricane Harvey, COVID-19, so it, it is pretty varied. And so we'll kind of dive a little bit deeper into some of these, these inequities across disaster. Next slide, please. So beginning with the current COVID-19 pandemic, physical environment, geography, race and ethnicity, age, insurance coverage, language, employment status and sector, socioeconomic status, educational attainment, and healthcare access have all been associated with an increased risk of infection or an increased risk of experiencing a severe or fatal course of disease. So if we look at this figure on the right-hand side of the slide, an analysis conducted by the Kaiser Family Foundation identified that American Indian and Alaska Native, Black and Hispanic people 
have experienced disproportionate rates of illness and death due to COVID-19. And the higher rates of infection and death among these populations may reflect an increased risk of exposure due to living, or as Abby mentioned, working conditions, and the increased risk of experiencing serious illness if infected can be attributed to higher rates of underlying health conditions and barriers to testing and treatment due to existing disparities in healthcare access. Next slide, please. So then we'll focus in a little more on that work and the idea of workplace exposures. Um, so a study conducted in Massachusetts in 2020 described differences in mortality due to COVID-19 among occupations, as well as how occupational differences varied by race and ethnicity. So in this figure on the left, it is shown that workers in 11 major occupation groups, um, healthcare support, transportation and material moving, food preparation and serving, building and grounds cleaning and maintenance, production, construction and extraction, installation and maintenance and repair, protective services, personal care and service, arts, design, entertainment, sports and media, and community and social service had age adjusted mortality rates higher than the rates for all workers. And that likely reflects the need for them to be in person or working on site during those early days of the pandemic. And then on the right hand side of this table, or the right hand side of the slide, we can see a table that shows that in almost all instances when sufficient data by race and ethnicity were available, Hispanic and black workers had higher rates of mortality than white workers in the same occupation group. So looking at food workers, um, Hispanic food preparation and serving workers had a mortality rate eight times that of white food preparation and serving workers. Similarly, black healthcare support workers had a mortality rate nearly three times higher than that of white healthcare support workers. Next slide, please. Um, so now we'll look beyond the COVID-19 pandemic, looking at examples of inequities and other disasters. In a nationwide study looking at heat-related illness from 2001 to 2010, persons hospitalized due to heat-related illness were more likely to be of older age, maintain residence in the lowest zip code income quartile, be uninsured, and be hospitalized in a rural area. Moreover, an assessment of the economic burden of hospitalization for heat-related illness, it was identified that Blacks, Hispanics, and Asian and Pacific Islanders experienced greater hospitalization costs when compared to whites, as did females when compared to males. Next, racial and ethnic minority populations are more likely to die as a result of a natural disaster or extreme weather event than non-Hispanic whites. When compared to non-Hispanic whites, the mortality rate per 100,000 was 1.87 times higher among non-Hispanic Blacks and 7.34 times higher among non-Hispanic American Indian or Alaska natives. And lastly, despite similar or greater intent to get vaccinated against H1N1, African American, Latino, and persons of lower socioeconomic status were less likely to have been vaccinated. And it was concluded that factors potentially contributing to inequities in vaccine uptake included barriers to access, inadequate or inaccurate information, and concerns about both safety and efficacy. Next slide, please. So next we'll turn our attention to the incorporation of principles of health equity into emergency planning and response efforts and documents. So looking first at documents over a decade ago in 2006, an analysis of pandemic influenza preparedness plans for all 50 states and the District of Columbia identified that only 14% or seven plans mentioned equity in some capacity. And this was most often in the context of pharmaceutical allocation. In a broader review, in 2007, a search was conducted to identify the extent to which existing emergency preparedness research and interventions focused on racially or ethnically diverse populations. It was identified that of websites providing information on emergency preparedness, only 50% or, or 149 made single mention of racial or ethnic minorities. More recently, in 2020, 29 state-level crisis standards of care plans were analyzed, and it was identified that only 15 or 52 percent listed health equity as a guiding principle. However, as of early 2020, there was no literature published on workplace protections for essential workers during emergencies, which is especially alarming considering disparate workplace exposures, particularly in the early months of the COVID-19 pandemic. Next slide, please. 
So next we'll focus on interventions to address health inequities. And so we have outlined four examples of actions jurisdictions have taken, and these were identified through that literature search Abby had mentioned. So first in Rhode Island, the Rhode Island Special Needs Emergency Registry was created. And this is a registry to be used to identify and assist persons with special health care needs during times of emergency. The registry has three main disability categories, mobility, life support, and sensory or cognitive. Mobility covers any assistive aids. Life support provides information on mechanical devices or treatments needed. And sensory or cognitive provides information on impairments or conditions. And this can be referenced by first responders and healthcare providers during, during times of emergency. Second, in Massachusetts, healthcare providers, community members, lawyers, ethicists, and disability advocates came together to form a coalition and they revised the state's crisis standards of care to reduce discrimination based on comorbid conditions or disability status. And this occurred in early 2020, right, right before the major surge in COVID-19 cases. Third, in South Carolina, amid the thousand year flood, the state acted swiftly to ensure that the needs of people with disabilities were efficiently and rapidly addressed. So specific actions included ensuring the presence of American Sign Language interpreters at press conferences, and the provision of functional needs accommodations at shelters. And lastly, fourth, in Los Angeles during the H1N1 outbreak, a county health department provided timely information in the six most commonly spoken languages, and they also established multilingual communication channels. So they promoted the access to timely and accurate information. Next slide, please. So then looking more specifically at interventions amid the COVID-19 pandemic, in Minnesota, the Mayo Clinic partnered with African-American churches to disseminate accurate information on COVID-19 transmission and risk. So more specifically, during an eight-week period in the spring of 2020, 120 churches were equipped with emergency preparedness manuals, and they delivered 230 messages via social media, mainly Facebook and email and an estimated 6,539 unique persons viewed this content. In California, the state considers 25 health equity measures, including metrics on healthcare access, economic stability, social and community context, and the built environment when determining counties' abilities to adopt less restrictive disease mitigation measures. So in order for a county to move into a less restrictive tier, the test positivity rate and its lowest quartile census tract must not substantially lag behind the county's overall test positivity rate. Thirdly, in, in North Carolina, work groups and coalitions were organized to assist public health and governmental leaders in developing strategies and tactics to reduce disparities in disease outcomes. Examples of efforts included deploying community health workers as trusted points of contact, conducting testing and vaccine events in partnership with community-based and faith-based organizations, and providing guidance to health systems and health departments on how best to connect with traditionally hard to reach populations. And lastly, recommendations to protect essential workers and mitigate disease transmission within the workplace and subsequently the greater community have been created to guide institutions amid infectious disease outbreaks. And so now I'll turn it back over to Abby. Thanks, Sarah. Um, yep, and we can go, yep. Thank you. Um, so I think, you know, as you heard all that, I hope that something that is sticking out to you is we have kind of a foundation where health equity, health inequity is normalized, where certain people have greater access to what they need to be healthy than others do. And in a disaster or an emerging infectious disease outbreak, there is a compounding of that inequity. There's an increase in risk um, of exposure or disease um, without necessarily following through with um, the reciprocal, which is protections to make sure people have what they need um, to mitigate that risk, to be safe and healthy. Um, and so, you know, I think that the task of what do we do is is quite big, but I do think that there are some things that we know we can do um, in emergency preparedness and response as we think about how to move forward. Um, and I think one of them goes to kind of broadening, um, broadening the scope 
of who needs to be at the table when it comes to preparedness planning efforts um, that um, I think traditionally speaking, and certainly the literature prior to 2020, um, thought of frontline workers as healthcare workers. And so that meant a lot of um, what we what we owe to those healthcare workers was really carefully thought through in the literature. Um, if we're asking someone to take on increased risk and to take care of us in an emerging infectious disease, then we owe them um, safety um, in, in their work, taking care of us and making sure that we have what we need to, you know, as citizens, as community members. But that didn't necessarily expand from that literature prior to 2020 into other roles. And so what we know is true is that there are other workers who are going to be essential in any emerging infectious disease outbreak. And so we need an expanded definition and everything that follows with that expanded definition um, to make sure that they're safe and healthy as well, that those workers are safe and healthy as well. And so I think if you're thinking about, you know, if you're someone who works in a hospital and thinking about, well, what does that mean for me? I don't work in public health. I'm not thinking about transportation workers or um, meat processing workers. I think a key role in, in hospital facilities um, that may not have been incorporated into preparedness planning efforts in the past um, would be your environmental services workers, your waste management workers, people who um, really uh, do a great deal to ensure containment of an emerging infectious disease, but may not always be considered in, in the planning efforts that go towards um, that go towards protecting healthcare workers, it, people in clinical roles. Um, and so thinking about, and that can be for a lot of reasons. Some, some of those folks are contract workers. And so there are, are barriers in the contract that make it difficult for us to understand how to incorporate them into planning efforts. So thinking about some of those and, and kind of taking a, um, a broader look at requirements and greater representation in planning efforts in, in order to ensure that um, there, there are more stakeholders at the table looking at these things. Um, and then strengthening support structures prior to emergencies. Um, I think one key um, initiative that's, that's often cited for good reason is the implementing culturally and linguistically ap appropriate services and, and standards with it with um, with both language and, and thinking about the materials that go out to different groups. Um, we, we know that um, worksheets and handouts are great um, for some groups of people in terms of getting a message across, but that might not be the best way for others. So it's not just language, but it's also thinking about what actually is gonna make for good uptake when you're trying to communicate um, you know, non-pharmaceutical interventions, protective measures that we're thinking about in these spaces um, for different communities. Um, and, and then I think a really key role is the community health worker and really thinking about how community health workers and community advocate organizations can intersect with preparedness response in meaningful ways and that those folks often are the most trusted messengers of information, of resources, um, of you know any kind of support structures and services, thinking about testing, thinking about vaccination, um, and making sure that there are key connects with actual people who work with th those communities day in, day out, who've built relationships and sustained engagement with the communities that they serve and ensuring that those those support structures are really supported um, both through funding and preparedness activities as well. And then I think, you know, another, another activity at kind of a national level um, that really I think is probably in the midst of different research currently um, based on the pandemic, but really thinking about research um, to ensure appropriate support, both epidemiolo epidemiological research and surveillance activities to really understand 
um, nationwide inequities in, in health, but also funding research on IPC, infection prevention and control measures. So thinking about protective equipment, engineering controls, administrative controls for different occupational settings, um, especially thinking about that, that, that idea of essential work. How do we make sure that, um, that, that the masks and engineering and administrative controls that would be in place are effective in, in those spaces. Um, and I think, you know, that also is important um, as businesses think about cost effectiveness and outcomes, um, you know, for, for, for the toll that they had in terms of an economic toll. Um, early on in the pandemic, being able to stay open was an advantage that many organizations had um, in an in essential industry. So how do um, they safeguard that workforce and really protect that workforce um, from, from risk of exposure? Next slide, please. So then I have some recommendations at the state and local level too, to kind of cover. Um, so increase I think one one big one going back to to the kind of fence example that we opened up is just increased in awareness about the significance and impact of health inequities. Um, thinking about where people are situated with regard to where they stand and their ability to see over the fence um, and to get over the fence if there's an emergency. So I think um, you know that's a really key point is just increased awareness of what it might take um, to make sure that, that we have what we need to ensure health equity in, in a disaster and emerging infectious disease. And I think, uh, you know, kind of to echo some of the recommendations from the, from the national um, level is that the hard work of relationship building, which um, recently um, Sarah and I have been taking part in a qualitative study over six counties over Nebraska, to look at um, you know, public health response in reg with regard to essential workers. And one of the key findings, which um, echoes this next bullet point, is the importance of relationships, the importance of the connections with community members, leaders, organizations um, that might be impacted by disasters or likely to be impacted. Um, but then making sure, as we've we've heard with some of, in some of our qualitative interviews, and as some of the six counties have mentioned um, in their after action reports from COVID nineteen, the importance of really um, having those relationships established and maintaining those relationships with key members within the community, with community health workers with leaders within organizations um, that could be impacted by disasters um, and, and really bringing them into the planning efforts to ensure that everything that we learned from COVID-19 really has longevity um, and supports the responsive, responsiveness of initiatives to the community's needs. Every community is going to be different. And I, I, I do, I love the, the quote that, all disasters are local and that really it does take the people at the local level to really understand what their communities need and how they do that is oftentimes by knowing one another and knowing who to talk to and that's you know that's not an easy fix that takes a lot of work but is really important um, to ensuring that people get, are getting what they need um, to ensure the health of their communities. And again, the, the support of community health workers, um, the support of, of language services, I think one thing that we definitely um, learned over the course of COVID-19 um, was that um, a, a, a flyer or a handout, as I mentioned earlier, might not be effective for every community um, when you're trying to get out the word, whether it be about a testing facility or a vaccination clinic, um, that word of mouth is also needed in some communities that Facebook might make a better um, site for that um, than, than um, maybe the, the health department's website. So learning about um, different services um, and what's effective. Um, and then the improvement of um, data collection, availability, and, and utilization to be able to use in real time to know um, where, 
where where help is where where help is needed is also a really important recommendation at that state and local level. And then we can go to the next slide. And I did just want to close um, and I'll have Sarah hop back on and see if she has anything to add to um, thinking about our kind of key example of work, um, health equity and work in the pandemic. And I think, you know, again, thinking about we know that certain communities that marginalize and minoritize communities um, have suffered disproportionately, not just during COVID-19, but prior public health emergencies as well. Um, and currently national planning efforts, um, while considerable financial resources have been devoted to pandemic influenza preparedness planning, for instance, um, at the federal and state levels, national planning efforts don't really address protecting low wage um, workers in essential industries, except for healthcare. So really thinking about how that that's a key gap to address um, moving forward and, and that emergency and pandemic preparedness efforts really need to be explicit in the attention and, and initiatives that they have um, to address to address health inequities, um, saying that you know we have gaps in in infection prevention and control guidance with regard to you know five key industries and how do we right set that um, moving forward? And I think that you know any kind of forward-looking public health guidance to protect workers um, really needs to ensure equity in both research. Um, are there adequate masks? Are there adequate models that help us guide um, what needs to happen in a different occupational setting? And also, are we preparing um, for not only vaccine allocation and, and therapeutic allocation, um, medical countermeasures, but also really importantly, infection prevention and control guidance for essential workers. And I might just see if Sarah has anything else that she, she wants to add as we close, and then hopefully we can address any questions that you all have. Thanks, Abby. Yes, and I think it's just important to reiterate, as Abby mentioned in the beginning, that. We, our recommendations have to be tailored to the communities and institutions in which they serve. They're not, they're not all encompassing and what works for one population won't work for every population. All right, well, thank you. Um, we do have some questions in the chat. Uh, I'm sorry, in the Q&A section. If you do have any questions right now, please go ahead and load them in there as well. Uh, first question, Abby is, and Sarah, how are you helping Pacific Islanders who do not always seek timely care for themselves or their children? Sarah, did any of the data that you look at address um, Pacific Islanders specifically or, and it's okay if it didn't, but I just thought I'd ask if you had seen anything in that lit the literature on that. So I, I have identified a couple of articles that have looked at pediatric health across racial and ethnic minority groups. And so that search and that article revealed that parents face stigma-related stigma logistical and socioeconomic barriers to accessing care for their children. Um, so I think with that in mind, it's important to identify ways in which communities can remove these barriers, whether it be having clinics in close proximity to the home, providing culturally specific information or educational materials, and as we've mentioned a few times, the deployment of community health workers. Okay, next question. Did you find any data on volunteers as essential workers and their risks, roles, and future recommendations. Sarah, I might turn to you again. Was there any data that you looked at on essential workers and volunteers as essential workers? I have not located a lot of information on the volunteer role aspect of essential workers, um, other than really that a lot of volunteer agencies were struggling to find volunteers throughout the pandemic just because of the inherent risk of serving in that position. But I, I haven't seen much more beyond that. That's an interesting question, Robin, though. Um, and we had definitely thought some about self-organizing volunteers um, through our work with RDHRE. Um, but allocation, 
of PPE is certainly something that I think um, was difficult across the board um, and effectiveness of PPE in certain occupational settings. It's not like, um, you know, a surgical mask or an N95 is effective, is might be effective in a, in a patient room but is that effective in a meat processing plant or what would you need for it that it to be in, in, you know effective in that environment and that also kind of goes to something that we touched on at the very end there the importance of research in certain occupational settings because i think we based a lot of the ppe and infection prevention and control guidance um, development on a healthcare <laughs> setting and we know that um, that's certainly not the case. And I would think that that's true for volunteers as well, that they might be going into different environments and um, the PPE or engineering and administrative controls that they're using there um, may not have be, been well studied in those environments, which means we don't know how effective they are. And this is kind of a, a key piece too. I think what, what we're saying is that if there is um, if we all are, if we're talking about equal risk here, if I have the same risk um, of contracting an emerging infectious disease at a health in a healthcare setting as someone does in a meat processing plant, how do we ensure we're giving equity and protections there? And I think where we're at a deficit in other environments is we don't necessarily have the evidence base that we do in a healthcare environment to know okay, yes, um, masking is the most effective um, thing that you can do in that environment or what type of mask should you be using? So, and I'm sure that might be the case too um, in volunteer settings. Hopefully we answered that question. Looks like that was the last question we have in our Q and A section. All right. With that said, Abby and Sarah, thank you very much for your presentation today. It was very informative. I actually enjoyed this one more than most of the other ones we've done in the past. Uh, it was a really good topic. Uh, to receive CEUs, please annotate the information on here. We'll also put this in our um, in the chat. Um, to find out about future webinars and presentations, please follow us on Facebook, and that's also in the chat. So with that. I'd like to thank you all for your time and we'll see you at our next webinar. Thanks for having us. Thank you.